So, all right, that said, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I am actually in the process of ordering Bibles to have to hand out in that, so I know I keep asking, and I think somebody back there is shivering, hoping nobody raises their hand, because I don't know if we have any back there. Um, but we will have some sometime soon. So, but if you're new to this, I always encourage you to bring your Bible with or pull it up on your phone or something like that. So here we are in John chapter 14. As we've mentioned a number of times along the way, once we got into John 13, we're in the upper room now. We're in the upper room transitioning over to the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus will be arrested. He'll be ultimately led away to mockeries of trials, and he'll ultimately be crucified and rise from the dead three days later. Uh, however, right now, just prior to that, he's imparting to his disciples, his friends, those who've been following him, uh, the, 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 the ones that he'd handpicked among the multitudes to ultimately be the ones that would carry on his work once he had gone to the cross, arose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. Uh, now Judas has departed at this point. He's gone off to, to set up the betrayal in the garden that will take place shortly, just really within a few hours' time. And, uh, and so it is now the remaining eleven who are with him, and Jesus is sharing with them some of the most profound truths of the Christian life, some of the most fundamental things that we need to understand and embrace about being a believer. And he'll talk about some of these things today. We'll start to look at a little bit of it today, but let me dive into the passage here as we move. Uh, the first, uh, move, looking at uh, chapter 14 in particular, starting in verse 15 is where we pick it up this week. By the way, if you're interested in following all the previous studies in John before, there's like a thousand of them at this point. But you can go back to our YouTube page or our website and you can catch up to where we are. But we're in John chapter 14, starting in verse 15 this morning, where Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even, in the, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Father, we're thankful for this brief passage today, but in it we find the beginnings of some very important lessons that we're going to consider. And we pray that your Holy Spirit, whom we just began to read about, will in fact help us to understand these things, help us to apply them, help us to walk in them, help us to lean on you and trust in his power to meet us in our time of need. That Father, we just thank you that you've given us this beautiful gift of the Holy Spirit who who indwells us and helps us to follow and become more like Jesus. And we pray that that work would take place here today as we spend time together in your word. So we love you and thank you for this time and opportunity. And we pray for our brothers and sisters around the country who are starting to feel persecution for their faith, who are starting to be pressed against just for meeting. We pray that you give them wisdom, you give them courage, and that, Lord, when the time comes, you'd give us the same. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. You'll keep my commandments. Whoa, man, that's legalism. No, it's not. No, it's not. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. The idea of obedience in the Christian life is oftentimes kind of discounted as being kind of a, hey, wait a minute, I'm under grace. What's this idea of walking in obedience all about? Well, Jesus considers that to be an act of love for him. If you walk in the ways that I've taught you, that's a demonstration of your love for me, is essentially what Jesus is saying here. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. Um, the Christian life is one that is rooted, steeped in, covered by, infiltrated by, completely overwhelmed with the idea of grace. And rightly so. Grace is receiving those things which we don't deserve by God's hand, His gracious hand. Starting with the idea of salvation. You and I are saved by grace through faith. We believe, not do. We don't perform some feat of, 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 of you know, some, some spectacular feat of uh, trying to impress the Lord or something like this. But no, we trust entirely on what Jesus finished at the cross, having died for our sins, every last one, past, present, and future. We find ourselves free from the penalty of those things by God's grace. It's simply appropriated by faith. But the work itself, the finished work, is something we look to Jesus but to alone, completely. It's all Him. That's grace. And for, uh, for some, the idea of being saved by grace is sort of a finish line. It's the idea, well, that's where it stops. My relationship with Christ is settled. I put my trust in Him. I believe in Him. But that's as far as it needs to go. And therefore, there's no real change in life that takes place as a result of what Jesus has actually forgiven us from. Uh, and, and, and in some cases, 
uh, there is this sense that Jesus has forgiven me for all of my sins, past, present, and future. I'm saved by grace, and therefore it makes no difference what I do, because after all, that was paid for. And it becomes something of a license for sin, or a license for casual, a casual approach to sin, or a casual approach to the lifestyle that we once lived, but frankly we're saved from. I always like to say this, Jesus loves you just the way you are. However, he loves you too much to leave you that way. I'm thankful for that on a personal level because I know what I used to live like. And I'm thankful that Jesus loved me enough to begin to chisel those things away that I might become a little more like him and a lot, a lot less like what I used to be. And so that's what grace not only does in terms of our salvation, but grace is also, also that which we walk in during this process that the Bible calls, and I'll use this bible word, sanctification, the idea of being further and further set apart for Him. That's what the word sanctification means, being set apart. It's where the word holy comes from. The idea of being taken from this lifestyle over here where we were living in a certain kind of way that dishonored God and was a sin against Him, and now we begin to live in a very different way by His power, and when we fail, when we stumble, when we fall, and we will... There's grace there to pick us up and cover us. There's grace there to lead us through. There's grace there to undergird us so that we don't fall out of his salvation, but rather he catches us, he cleans us back up again as our feet are. There's a great analogy in the upper room which we read about. The idea of being clean, but once in a while just needing to get your feet washed. That's what grace does. However, we again should not see grace as a license to sin. Just to finish on that thought, Paul would say that all things are lawful for me. Wow. You know what the word all means in Greek? It means all, right? You've all heard that before, right? But all means all. It's a, it's a very broad term. All things are lawful for me. In other words, nothing will cost you like it used to. But not all things are profitable. Not all things build up or edify. And so a choice is given to us. How will we then live? If in fact we've been bought and paid for by the blood of Christ, will we see that as sort of a license to sort of live like we want and never really give the Holy Spirit that, that, that space to change us? Or will we choose to give Him that space to change us, follow after Jesus with intention and purpose, and know that even though we stumble, even though we fall, there is the call to walk with Him. That, like Paul would say, I've been bought at a price, therefore I will glorify God, not in theory, but with my body. Physically, practically, I will walk in His ways. As for me and my household, if Josh were around in the New Testament, he might adapt it somewhat in the wording, but essentially the sentiment stays the same. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a choice we make. And the Holy Spirit giving us a new nature, helps us to do battle against the old nature and to live differently. We choose, God ultimately works in us, we become more like Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. And Jesus says, when you do that, when you obey my commands, that's a demonstration of your love for me. And how can it not be? Think about the flip side of that coin. Are we really demonstrating we love Jesus when we're living in some way that totally offends Him and would never be what He'd want us to do? Of course not, right? It's like our children, right? A lot of kids here today. When you go out and you do things, just like when I was a kid, believe it or not, all the old people around you, we were once your age, and uh, we used to do the thing I'm going to tell you not to do. We used to go out and we used to do all kinds of stuff that if our parents found out about it or your grandparents found out about it, they'd be really disappointed. We would maybe have brought shame to the family name. We would maybe bring down people's impression of what our family is about and that kind of a thing. We ought not do that, right? We understand that even in a family sense. Well, imagine the Lord too, right? Now again, you're not, not part of the family just because you do that. You're still a son, you're still a daughter, but it's a shame that we do those things. Same with the kingdom of God. We are a child of God. We're bought and paid for by the blood of Christ. I am His Son, but I still am capable of bringing shame to His name, and I don't want to do that. I want to walk in obedience. I want to walk in a way that blesses Him and causes others, others to want to bless Him as well. You know, there's that expression, a chip off the old block, and then there's that expression, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. One is a positive connotation. The other one sometimes has a negative connotation with it. You know? I want, to, I want people to see me and, and think highly of my Father in Heaven. 
that Jesus is essentially painting that kind of a concept there before them. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. It means not walking in disobedience, but rather acknowledging that his ways are higher than ours. Walking in his ways is a, is a thing that honors and blesses him. It's a very simple idea, really. But we ought not somehow brush it under the rug of legalism, thinking that somehow we're, we're walking according to the law and not according to grace. No. Grace gives us the capacity to walk in a way that pleases him. Let's not shine that on. Let's do that. Let's accept that. Now that statement, by the way, may seem strange and out of place when he then talks about sending, praying, and having the Holy Spirit, his Father send the Holy Spirit. But it actually is a beautiful connecting. It's a bridge, kind of a passage between uh, what we read last week and what we're about to dive into this week, where Jesus talks about uh, those who do works in his name and even greater works in his name because he goes to the Father, whatever you ask in my name, this I'll do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Not a total change of thought here. He's moving from one topic to another, but he's not leaving the subject all behind. The whole concept here is still about what it's going to look like in and through believers once he's gone. The idea of asking the Father, asking in Jesus' name, the idea of being given confidence to know that God will work in those ways that will honor him and, and forward the kingdom and such, will honor the Son, that's something that we want to walk in confidence and, and love the idea of participating in in the days to come. And in concert with that, when we walk according to those things that Jesus said, that will demonstrate that we love him. It's an evidence of the fact that we love him. And then he says on top of that, then he will pray the Father, and the Father will send the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says, again in verse uh, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. Important point. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now he's talking here about the Holy Spirit, who will, who will name as the Holy Spirit in the passages to come. But here he refers to him as another helper. This is not the first time that the Holy Spirit has been mentioned, not only in the Gospel of John, but throughout Jesus' ministry. In the Gospel of John alone, we see the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus in the form of a dove at his baptism. Uh, we see the Holy Spirit mentioned a number of times along the way in the Gospel. John mentions that the Holy Spirit, in retrospect, remember John writes the Gospel not in real time, so when you read those passages, it sounds like he knows something that's coming, but if he's, obviously he's not writing it while he's living it. He's writing it actually 60 years later, around 90 AD. And as he is thinking back to the time when these events were taking place, he parenthetically says in chapter 7, he makes reference to the Holy Spirit, which has not been, yet been given. Okay, but he already knows when he's writing these things what's coming. Uh, we see in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, the difference between being born of the flesh and being born of the spirit. Uh, we see in John chapter 4, where he meets the woman at the well, the woman in Samaria there, where he goes in there, and there she is, and he talks about those worshiping God must worship him in spirit and in truth. The idea that there is something different about the human side of these activities and the idea of being infused and empowered by the Holy Spirit to ultimately worship God in a way that blesses and pleases Him. Uh, and here, though, we find something happening that brings tremendous clarity to this idea of what or who or what's going on when we talk about the Holy Spirit. In John chapters 14, 15, and 16, the Holy Spirit is mentioned many times. And he is mentioned in very personal terms. I start with that simply to say this. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. We've talked before about the Trinity. As impossible of a concept as it is, as it is for us to get our mind around this, the scriptures portray the nature of God as being triune. There is Father, there is Son, and there is Holy Spirit. The three equal persons within the one being that is called God. We worship one God as Christians. Somehow, though, the nature of God is such where there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not one person differently manifested, but three distinct persons. The Father wills, the Son wills, the Holy Spirit wills. Again, I don't claim to understand how that can be, but that it is, is not in question at all, scripturally speaking. Unless you're in a cult. 
then of course the entire definition of the nature of God is something that is completely different. And I say that's why I start with something as simple as the idea that the Holy Spirit is a person and not, as the Jehovah's Witnesses might say, God's active force or something like that. Just as an example, of course there's much more that could be said. An example of this would be in Acts chapter 5. I'll commend you to read this after uh, after our meeting today at some point because I just want to continue to move but Acts chapter 5 we're all familiar with the passage of Ananias and Sapphira and how the people of that time were bringing their were selling their their goods their properties and stuff and they were giving the funds to the apostles to distribute as the apostles saw the need throughout the body um, I promise you there's an irony I know because we're in election season and there are avowed socialists running for office this is not a, an example of socialism. People willingly gave in order to help others. This was not required of them, and that is the whole point of the passage. Ananias and Sapphira take and sell their property. They hold back half of it, but they make it sound as though they've given all. They've donated all of the proceeds to the apostles to be distributed because they want it to be seen as being really generous. Well, that was hypocrisy, and Peter calls them out and says, was this not all yours to do with as you please? You could have kept all of it if you wanted to, in other words. But why is the, has, has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Lie to the Holy Spirit? There's personality at play here. And he goes on and finishes the thought by saying, you've not lied to men, but to God. Equating the Holy Spirit with God and giving personality to the Holy Spirit. That's one example of many throughout the New Testament, and I would even suggest the Old Testament, where we can see the personality of the Holy Spirit in view. Now, I, I, I make all of that case because at the time Jesus is telling the disciples about it, they are not aware of this. They don't understand the idea of the Trinity at this stage. This is something that in the, con in the, in the, in the unfolding of the New Testament, as, as God continues to give revelation both to, the, uh, uh, to Paul, to, to Peter, to, to the rest of the New Testament writers, they become aware of the nature of God being such. But the idea of the Trinity was not something that Old Testament believers, and, and even in the New Testament up to this point, would have necessarily understood. In retrospect, you can go back, and now that we understand the nature of God from the New Testament revelation, we can see the implication or the uh, the hints of this throughout the Old Testament. But this is a, a an enormous idea that is now being told to them. And Jesus will, in chapter 16, say, "It's actually to your benefit that I go away, because when I do, the Holy Spirit will come." The Holy Spirit is now being referred to in chapter 14 in personal terms. He says, I will send, I will pray, and the Father will send you another helper. Okay? Let's talk about the word another for just a moment. The word another, there are a couple of words that can be used to explain or express the idea of another in the New Testament. One is heteros, which is a word that whose root should sound familiar to most of us. The idea of hetero, the idea that there is a different kind. Okay? Uh, uh, you know, I'm a boy, my wife's a girl, right? There's something similar about us, but we are fundamentally different in a lot of ways. The other word is the word alos, which speaks of another of the same kind. Hey, here's my Bible. I left it at home. Actually, I left my guitar at home today, so I used another one. It's a different guitar, but it's a guitar, right? It's basically the same kind of a thing. Unless you're a guitar player, then you know all the different nuances and stuff. But if I say, here's a guitar, can I have another? You're not going to give me a drum set. Right? You understand the idea of another in that context. It's another of the same kind. Well, that's what Jesus is saying here. I'm, somebody will come who is in many ways a lot like me, but is different from me, but is in a lot of ways the same as me. Again, that may sound clumsy, but think about what Jesus is saying and who he's saying it to. Jesus understands his own nature. The disciples do not. And so he explains something in terms that they can understand. When I go away, another helper will come. Somebody who is just like me, but distinct from me. And that's an interesting concept. And as we continue to go through this, uh, the gospel, we'll talk more about this as we go. Or... And I, I hate to sound like I'm shamelessly plugging, but 
We did a whole series, like 10 parts on the Holy Spirit, on our daily podcast, which you can actually watch too. We spent a lot of time on this. So another, another comforter or helper, or some of your translations say advocate, which is actually what the word means. It's the same word that is used multiple times by John when referring to the Holy Spirit as a helper or a comforter. It's also the same word he uses in 1 John chapter 2. I'll invite you to turn there for a moment. 1 John is toward the end of your Bible. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, then Jude, then Revelation. In 1st John chapter 2, and by the way, this word is only used by the Apostle John. And it's used in his Gospel, and it's used in his first epistle. In chapter 2 of 1st John, notice what John says here. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not ours only, but those of the whole world, he would go on to say. But the idea here of an advocate before the Father if we sin. The idea of an advocate in this context means somebody who stands uh, before us, or between us, before the Father, and makes our case. In other words, by simply looking at the Son, the Father can see that the sins of the world have been paid for. He is our advocate. He's the one who is the evidence and the case. He is the case that is made for our being right before God in spite of our sin. Same word. In John chapter 14, the Holy Spirit is called the advocate. It's been said that Jesus stands before the Father as our advocate and the Holy Spirit stands between us and the world and is our advocate. In other words, He is the evidence that we belong to God. And Jesus says so. He will be with you forever. He will be with you and he will be in you. More on that as we go through. But the idea here is that the Holy Spirit advocates on our behalf, as it were. He is the evidence. He is the case that is made to our, to our belonging to God and constantly being changed more to his image, making perfect sense in the context of obedience and these kinds of things. The Holy Spirit is central to the life of a believer. And Jesus is telling his disciples that he is coming. That he is coming and he will be with them and as we'll see he'll be in them he will send another helper to be with you forever forever always the Bible teaches us that upon becoming believers as becoming children of God that God takes up residence within us he lives within us the Holy Spirit resides within us sometimes uh, uh, it's just, uh, he's described as sort of like being equivalent to the Shekinah glory that existed in the camp of Israel, now dwelling within believers in this kind of an idea. Um, whatever that actually looks like, if, you know, if, if God could draw a picture of us or send us a picture of what it looks like for God to live within people, whatever that clumsily looks like, the fact is, is that we no longer are by ourselves in this life, but rather the Holy Spirit lives within us. And He's with us forever forever and he's also called the spirit of truth he's, there's, there's a number of ways that Jesus refers to him in this brief passage for starters again he is the answer to Jesus prayer the good shepherd here providing that and procuring that which believers are going to need as sheep are going to need and so the Holy Spirit will come and he ultimately is an answer to that prayer he is a helper who is just like Jesus yet distinct from him and then it goes on to, to mention here, I guess I should stop here for a moment and, and interject this. The Holy Spirit is also somebody that the world cannot receive. Right? Because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. The difference between a believer and an unbeliever is not behavior. That should be a distinguishing characteristic. There should be evidence based on the way we live as we've spoken of. But the fundamental difference between a believer and an unbeliever is not just your behavior. It is the fact that one has God living within them and one does not. You're a saint or you ain't. You're saved or you're lost. You're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, God within you, or you're not. And He's not indwelling you. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not indwell people like he does believers today. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people frequently for a, a moment, whether it was 
Solomon, whether it was Saul, whether it was David, the Holy Spirit would come upon people in the Old Testament for various times and purposes. But he didn't indwell people like we do today. That's a New Testament concept. Old Testament people who believed in God died in faith in what was coming. But they were not sealed and indwelled like we are today. It's a different kind of an economy, which again is its entire thing in its own. They were saved by faith, don't get me wrong. They were saved by grace just like you and I. But they didn't have the benefit of the Holy Spirit living within them like you and I do. They didn't have the benefit of a new nature being given to them like you and I do. It's different. As a matter of fact, it's in this same gospel in chapter 20 when Jesus, in the upper room after the resurrection, breathes on the disciples and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. And for the first time, we have New Testament believers. We have people indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And then after that, the Holy Spirit came upon them as they, in the day of Pentecost, they began their ministries uh, once they were endued with power from on high. But the world, that's a different thing altogether. What does it mean that the world doesn't see or know the Holy Spirit? Well, obviously, they don't see the Holy Spirit working in their lives in, in, in the same way a believer does. They don't see the Holy Spirit's activity the way a believer would see it. They might be convicted. We read earlier in the Gospel how the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and such. But that's an external thing that they are being confronted with to help them understand they need to be right with God. It's, he is intended to show them in that context that they do not know Him and need to be saved. And so, in the world you don't have the Holy Spirit like in the church or in the body of Christ. It's a distinction that needs to be understood. And so therefore this is something that is particular to believers. Now unfortunately for many people the Holy Spirit is a, is, is a topic that is sadly often misunderstood uh, the Holy Spirit is often kept at arm's length because He's kind of the X factor in the Trinity. Weird things are associated with the Holy Spirit. People run around the sanctuary and bang their heads on the walls and start clucking like chickens and barking like dogs and and you know, or maybe something not even that deliberately crazy. But you know, there on the other end of the spectrum, there are some people that would leave you thinking that the Holy Spirit tells them where to start brushing their teeth in the morning. And just like they just, God's talking to them all the time. Um, we need to understand the person of the Holy Spirit. And we need not be afraid of Him. The Holy Spirit is not crazy. He's not the X factor of the Trinity. He's not the loose cannon of the Godhead. Uh, he doesn't make you do crazy things. He's not to be feared. He's to be embraced in the same way we would embrace the Father and Son. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, I will send you another advocate, another, somebody who is distinct from me, but like me. Well, if you don't think Jesus is some kind of an X-factor loose cannon, why would we think the Holy Spirit is? Because some people have misunderstood what he does and all those kinds of things and have acted in such ways as to cause many of us to back away. And we ought not do that. We ought to embrace the Holy Spirit as the one who indwells us, empowers us for ministry, is the seal of our salvation. All of these wonderful, beautiful things that He does and, and that He is, frankly. The Holy Spirit, uh, as, as again, we use these terms because we just have to say something, but as the, first, as the third person of the Trinity, He is every bit God as Father and Son. And we need to know Him. We need to appreciate what He does and who He is and invite Him into our lives in ways that allow us to walk with Jesus with power and, and victory over sin in our lives and things like this, and even equipping us for works of ministry so that we might do the work that God calls us to and not do it in our own strength. And so Jesus begins now to sort of crack open the door a little bit to the person of the Holy Spirit in a much more personal way with the disciples here in John 14. And he, he begins to talk about him in, in, in some very practical kinds of ways that they can understand. Uh, and... Uh, I mentioned before the idea where Jesus talked about obeying Him and the idea of sanctification, holiness, being separate. Well, let's start with that name when it comes to the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit, right? 
In other words, He is the Spirit of holiness. He is the one who separates us and calls us and pulls us further away from the world and closer and closer into the image of Christ. He is holy. He is pure. He is right. He is good. He is, you know, the Bible says that in God is light and no darkness at all. Well, that's true of the Holy Spirit as well, right? And so, He is the Holy Spirit. But then what else does Jesus have to say about Him? Well, uh, he goes on here in the passage. He calls him in verse 17, the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. Okay? I've often said, and I've stolen this shamelessly from Ravi Zacharias, who I think got it from someone else too, but there's nothing as beautiful as the truth. Okay? There's nothing as beautiful as the truth. Error and mistruth, deception, these things are horrifying because of the implications and consequences they bring into the lives of people. But truth, in its beauty and its purity, is the most beautiful thing in the world. Because it clears away the darkness, it clears away uh, the things that would mislead in all of this. Well, the Holy Spirit leads us into truth. Jesus would soon say that the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth and remind them of the things that He has said. And so, when the Holy Spirit is active in the life of a believer, He is about the business, among other things, of leading us into a deeper understanding of the truth of God. All right? And in particular, when we talk about truth, we're talking about truth with a capital T. We're not just talking about, you know, passing things or whatever, although you, I'm not saying we're detaching from that, but primarily we're focusing here on the idea of truth with a capital T, ultimate truth, truth that matters for all people, for all time, for all eternity. And the Holy Spirit will guide us into that truth. Now primarily the way He does that is that He illuminates the Scriptures to us. We open the Word of God and the Holy Spirit helps us to understand these things. Sometimes it's through a teacher. Sometimes it's in our own personal, deep Bible study to come to understand what the Scriptures are saying. We ought to have both. By the way, I might be your pastor, but I still sit under other pastors. I learn from other pastors. I never stop trying to grow myself. And so we all spend time in the Word of God, learning and growing. And ultimately, as we do, the Holy Spirit is helping us to connect the dots to understand the beauty of, this, of, of the truth that God has given us in His Word. Um, and that's an important thing for us to understand as well, because there are a lot of people that claim to hear from the Holy Spirit and go on to say things that are absolutely untrue. An extreme example of this was years ago when one of the faith teachers on TV talked about how each member of the Trinity had its own Trinity, and he claimed this was a word from God. No, it wasn't a word from God. It was an absolute mistruth. And whether you knew it and were lying or whether you were just being a goof in front of millions of people saying something so ridiculous, I don't know. But that was not the Holy Spirit. That is not the nature of God. That's not, how, that's not how God is. He has told us how He is. And when you claim to have some new knowledge of this that somehow goes against what God has already said, then you stand in judgment for what you say. By the way, that's one of the reasons why James tells people not to be so quick to be teachers because ours is the stricter judgment. It's a holy thing. It's a terrifying thing to realize that you all go home and maybe listen to something I say and do something with it. If I tell you something wrong, that's account there's accountability for that kind of thing. I'm not scared of God in the sense like He's looking for reasons to... But, but I take this seriously, as, as all Bible teachers should. Because the Holy Spirit has given us the Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is therefore useful, profitable, right? Well, the Holy Spirit helps us know these things so that we might grow in truth as we grow in our faith. And so He is the, uh, he is the Spirit of truth. Now, as we mentioned before, uh, we'll say again here too, uh, uh, just prior to that, He said that the Holy Spirit will be with you, right? Now, the Holy Spirit... Up to that point, by the way, up to the point of John 20 where the Holy Spirit will indwell them. To this point, the Holy Spirit came alongside. The word there speaks of being near or beside. Okay? He is with you. When I walk in and out of here, I'm with my wife and daughter. We're near each other. We're beside each other. We're close by. Right? The idea of being with. You're here with somebody this morning. That's different from in, which we'll talk about in a moment. But the Holy Spirit is active in the world and He is near us in a practical way. And He's 
as we mentioned earlier, he is convicting people on the outside of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, and these kinds of things. So the Holy Spirit is with us. He is beside. However, he goes on to talk about, and let's read this verse again in verse 17, even the spirit of truth in the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now we already talked a little bit about this, but let me kind of bring this around for now. We'll pick up next week. But a very important element of what it means that the Holy Spirit is in us. It means that God dwells within us. We mentioned that. That's a massive thing. But the Holy Spirit also seals us. The fact that He's with us forever and He's in us even. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment. Turn right up. About seven books or so. After Galatians, you get to Ephesians. If you hit Philippians, you went a book too far. Now it's interesting in first in another writing, First Corinthians, Paul says that do you not know that your God's temple and the Spirit, or God's Spirit dwells within you? Listen to what he says here in Ephesians. In particular in verse thirteen and fourteen. In him or in Christ you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Um, when you believed the gospel, in that moment when you came to faith, when you put your trust in Jesus, you recognized it was no longer your works, your efforts, it wasn't some other religion. It wasn't some other philosophy or worldview. It was Jesus who ultimately came as God in the flesh and died for your sins, washed you clean. By grace you are saved now. When you came to believe the gospel, that word of truth, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Some of you all are into this thing called canning. Right? Where you put pickles in a jar or salsas or whatever you guys do and and somehow this thing is like hermetically sealed or some kind of a thing. I'm always reminded of Johnny Carson and Funk and Wagnall's porch and all that kind of thing. But but this jar is like sealed and it's airtight and I guess that preserves it for a really long time and this kind of, I, obviously I don't do this, but I've received canned things. Sealed things like this. And there is this beautiful sound that happens when you finally are able to get not just the lid off, but then you pry open that inner part, that inner part of the lid there, and it's, you know, comes off, and uh, it's fresh. This is going to be awesome, right? Well, when you came to Christ, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're now kept for that time when you get to enter eternity. Like, you stay ready until that time. There's no, there's no missing it. There's no falling out of it. You are sealed there until the time when you go into eternity. Right? That's what the Holy Spirit does. Um, we've read. The, hopefully, you remember this passage. But for those who may not have heard, turn to First Peter with me, a little further to the right. First Peter, chapter one. First Peter, chapter one. In verse 3, Peter starts saying these things. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded or who are kept through faith for his salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There's two things being kept there. 
One is that inheritance. It's not going to fade away. It's not going to rust. It's not going to decay. It's going to be brand new when you get there. The other thing that's being kept is you, who are kept to that time. Okay? Two things. What you're kept for and you being kept for it. Two things are in view there. Well, how does that happen? Well, that is what the Holy Spirit does. He indwells us. He seals us. Which means you and I as believers, if you're here today and you've put your trust in Christ, and this is true of you, that you are kept by the power of God until that day. Which means you are safe and secure until... There's a lot of peace that comes with that. There's a lot of comfort. There's a lot of there's a lot of recognizing the full scope of what our advocate has done for us. Jesus and the another advocate, the Holy Spirit is doing in us right now and has done in terms of sealing us. As a Christian, you and I live in a very different way. I guess we started by talking about this this morning before we began the message, but you and I live in a very different place as believers. Um, before I was a Christian, this is probably true of you as well, and if you're not a believer here today, this is probably true of you today. And it's certainly true of the world. Most people, unless they've kind of given in to the concept of atheism, most people in the world are expecting one day to stand before their maker. And most people are expecting are hoping to have done enough good things so that when they stand before him, they'll be able to sort of show this angry God who's just looking for an opportunity to blast him into hell. Look, but wait. Look what I did. And they'll hopefully, in their minds, here's the good stuff, here's the bad stuff. They're going to hope the good stuff kind of outweighs this. And God will sort of be obligated to let him in. Because after all, I guess I did more good things than bad things, right? God's fair, right? And so, because that concept or some version of it is what most people think, uh, they live a life that for the most part is spent not thinking about God. But when they do, they think about that. Maybe I can do another good thing here. I did this. I'm not as bad as that. Because they always feel like somehow they're going to have to explain themselves and make a case for themselves before the Father. But the Christian lives in a very different place. We have an advocate who stands before the Father today, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And when God looks at you and I, he sees us through the finished, judged case of Christ. All that sin... All that wickedness, all the, every wrong thought you and I ever had, everything. God no longer sees that on us. He sees that as having been paid for by His Son. Now, before we accidentally or mistakenly paint a picture of God as being this angry judge who thank God Jesus stood there because if God got His way, we'd be in hell. No, that's, that's not the picture we should have of this whole concept of advocacy and such. Remember, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, right? This was God's initiating of these things. God loved us, and so therefore He made the way for us to be saved. But the fact of the matter is, is that our sin did stand in the way. Our sin was something to be reckoned with. Our sin was a big deal and was costly. Our sin is what would have separated us and would have sent us to hell. But Jesus now stands as the one who paid that debt once and for all, and so no longer do we have to fear we have an advocate before the Father. If hypothetically it was like a human court where the judge saw the guilty party and was about to pronounce judgment and then all of a sudden the one who paid the debt got in between and said, wait a minute, your justice, your judgment, that's fair, that's right, that's deserved, no doubt, no question, but here's the thing, I paid it already. Oh. Well, yes, the ledger is clear. I can see now that that debt has been paid. That's what Jesus does. And now the Holy Spirit, in this side of the equation, here on this side of eternity, continues to make us more and more like the one who advocates for us. Not so that we can become righteous enough for heaven, but simply so we can become more like Him. That becomes our opportunity to surrender and say, Lord, have all of me. After what you've done for me, all I want to do is live a life that blesses and pleases you. And since I can't do it on my own, 
Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to seal me so I can know I can walk in confidence. I don't have to walk in fear, but also to help make me more and more like Jesus. It's a willing, beautiful privilege that Christians have. No longer do we live in fear. We live by faith. No longer do we have to run away from God. We can run to God. We can rest in God. This is the beautiful privilege. This is the beautiful opportunity of a Christian. That's why we follow Jesus. It's finished. We don't have to be afraid. Rather, we can run to Him, accepted in the Beloved. And because we're sealed, we know that no one else is going to take us out of His hands. After all, what did Jesus say? You know, uh, all that the Father has given me, of all of them, I'll lose none. They're in my Father's hands, they're in my hands. No one can snatch them away. And here we even see where the Holy Spirit has sealed us. Literally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have you and I in their hands. Could there be a more assuring, rest-filled thought? Could there be anything, any other news that could bring such confidence and peace of heart and mind to a believer every day? And on top of that, His mercies are new every morning. So with that said, we begin to look at the Holy Spirit. We begin to make our way or continue to make our way through the upper room discourse that Jesus shares with his friends, his disciples, his apostles, his friends whose hearts were troubled at the thought of his leaving. But he's now telling them that one is coming just like him that ultimately will carry them through the day. So let's pray. Let's ask, well, let's ask the Lord to help us to embrace the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're a believer here today, he already lives within you. Surprise! Yeah, but He already lives within you. But we want to embrace Him. We want to walk with Him. We want to open ourselves to Him that He might ultimately help us to become more like Jesus and that we would not resist the work He does in our lives toward that end. Father, we thank You for all of these things we've been studying today. We thank You that the Holy Spirit, He whom You've sent to ultimately dwell within us and even seal us, one who advocates for us, even much like Jesus, whoever lives to make intercession for us, even so too when we find ourselves weak and don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf as well. He guides us into all truth. He points us to Jesus. He seals us until the day when you ultimately bring home that which you have purchased. Father, there is so much for us to rejoice over. And Father, for any who are sort of put off by the Holy Spirit, that for some reason, or maybe because you know, just someone else has, has done some weird things in the name of the Holy Spirit, uh, has caused some to, to back away. We just pray that, that that falseness would be removed and that we would see Him clearly as our advocate, our helper, our comforter. Father, we receive, Lord, all the more fully and openly the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. We pray that he'd have the space he desires to clear out those things, to, to, to pry open those closets that we keep hidden, to uh, ultimately convict us, even in our own hearts, of those things that need to go, Father, not for our salvation's sake, but so that we might become more fully set apart in this life as we make our way to the next. We thank you for the eternity that we're sealed for. We thank you that as your children, your sons and daughters, that we need not fear that there's a judgment coming around the corner if we slip up. Father, we thank you that you already know we're going to slip up, that you were well aware of it before Jesus ever came into the world. But nonetheless, he took those sins and he paid for all of them so that we now can stand forgiven and free in your sight. And Father, for any among us who have never made that decision to follow Jesus, to put their trust in him for their eternity, I just pray for them right now that, Father, they wouldn't put it off anymore, that they wouldn't wait until later, that they wouldn't, for whatever their reasons are, not come. If that's you, I want to invite you to pray with me now. There's nothing magic about the words I'm going to say. It's just a way to help you learn to, sh to, to share with God, to come before Him honestly and openly, to confess that you need Him and to be saved. So pray with me if, you, if you're ready and if you would. Heavenly Father, I start by confessing to you that I'm a sinner. I'm unrighteous in and of myself. I've offended people. I've hurt people. I've done a lot of things wrong. But today I stop blaming others. And today I own it myself. And I acknowledge to you that this is who I am. But I thank you that in spite of that, 
that you love me so much that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, into the world to die for my sins, that I might not perish but have everlasting life, if I would simply put my trust in him. And so today I cast off all other pretenders, including myself, and I put my trust in Jesus. I believe he died for my sins, and that he rose again the third day to everlasting life. And I thank you that I no longer have to be afraid when I take my last breath and I stand before you. Lord, I pray that you'd help me in the power of the Holy Spirit to follow you all the days of my life. That I'd do the things you asked me to do. That I would follow your ways. And that I would seek to live a life that blesses you. Leaving my old life behind and walking in your ways. Thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you in advance for all the ways that you're going to help me to walk with you. And thank you most of all that one day I'll get to see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. By the way, if you prayed that prayer and you want to stick around and talk afterwards, please do so we can talk and pray. Because you're probably thinking, okay, well now what? What happens now? What do I do next? Well, that's an important thing to talk about and learn and kind of begin to take your first steps. But uh, the rest of us, let's go ahead, well actually all of us, why don't we go ahead and stand and let's sing a last song together and then we'll dismiss.